Uh, good morning. Can I welcome everyone to the 16th meeting of the Justice Committee in 2015? Can I ask everyone to switch off mobile phones and other electronic devices as they interfere with broadcasting, even when switched to silent? No apologies have been received. Uh, Patricia Ferguson, I welcome her uh, to the committee. And later, John Lamont will be attending as Margaret Mitchell's substitute for consideration of witnesses as witnesses for the Apologies Scotland Bill when we will have our revenge at last on Margaret Mitchell. <laughs> Item one. Nice to see you so on the <laughs> <laughs> There you are. Declaration of interest. Item 1, decision on taking business in private. I'm inviting you to agree to consider items 4, that's the call for written evidence on the Community Justice Bill, and 5, witnesses for the Apologies Bill in private. Are you agreed? Yes. Item 2, petition PE1567. Uh, the Public Petitions Committee last week referred petition PE1567 to this committee for consideration in the context of our scrutiny of the inquiries into fatal accidents and sudden deaths, etc. Scotland Bill. PE1567 by Donna O'Halloran is calling on the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to change the law and procedures in, regarding, in regards to investigating unascertained deaths, suicide and fatal accidents in Scotland. Are you content to consider this position as part of our scrutiny of the Bill? And keep the petition open. Thank you very much. Item two. This is our third evidence session on the inquiries into fatal accidents and sudden death. Scotland Bill at stage one. We'll hear from three panels of witnesses today, and I'll just ascend briefly to allow the first panel to take their places. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And before I welcome the panel, can I ask Roddy Campbell uh, to declare an interest? Thank you, Convener. Can I refer to my interest as a member of the Faculty of Advocates? Thank you very much. I welcome to meeting James Wolfe, QC Dean of the Faculty of Advocates, and Tom Marshall, President of the Society of Solicitor Advocates. And thank you both for your written submissions. And I'll go straight to questions from the members, please. Margaret, Elaine, Gill, Jane. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, Gentle. I wonder if we could look at the issue of delays. Um, you'll be aware that Lord Cullen recommended an early hearing um, to tackle this to be held within three months, just really, uh, I believe, to, to set out where the Crown Procurator Fiscal were and how imminent it would be for a fatal accident uh, inquiry to, to be held. Do you have any views on the early hearing? Mr Wolfe. Yes, thank you very much. Um, uh, Is it on? Thank you. You don't need to press, uh, James. It'll come okay. on. Thank you. Um, no, thank you very much. C can I first of all say that w we very much welcome this bill, which modernises the um, system for in inquiries into fatal accident and sudden deaths. Um, it's perhaps worth, by way of a preliminary, observing that FAIs vary enormously in their nature and complexity. They range from, at one end, uh, mandatory inquiries into, let's say, a death in custody, where, in fact, there is no real complexity to the, the matter and where the inquiry will convene, deal with the evidence very shortly, and the sheriff will then be able to make a determination on an entirely uncontroversial basis at one end where the matter would may be dealt with within a w within part of a day to at the other end um, extremely complex inquiries such as um, uh, two that I've conducted one the Rose Park inquiry which I conducted for the the crown and which I was led to believe was the longest FAI that had been held I hope it wasn't cause and effect but um, it, it, you know, a, a very long, complex and, and difficult inquiry for a variety of reasons. Um, and also the, the, the other one, in my own experience, the Declan Haney inquiry, which uh, followed on from uh, a prosecution. Um, uh, the fact that there are such, there's such a range and diversity of circumstances and a range of complexity in terms of the... Um, subject matter and nature of an inquiry, I think makes it very difficult to be prescriptive about timescales for starting an inquiry. And one then throws into, the, into that the uh, need where there is a criminal prosecution in 
uh, prospect or in consideration to um, allow the criminal process to be dealt with uh, by way of priority. So I, 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 while we all favour um, expedition and inquiries, uh, being overly prescriptive, in my, I, I, I would suggest, is not going to uh, be necessary or helpful. I don't think there is um, prescriptive. Uh, the idea of an early hearing is not to say the fatal accident inquiry should be held within a certain time scale. I, I think that's maybe a, a, another recommendation elsewhere. It's merely to say within three months, this is the state of play. It's to inform the relatives. It's to, if you like, um, concentrate the minds of the Crown and Procurator Fiscal Service to say we're looking at this investigating and we're wondering where you are. So it's making sure that it doesn't kind of disappear or get put in the back bench or there's no unnecessary delays. And as I understand, it doesn't have to be a very formal um, occasion. It can be in chambers, but it keeps the relatives in involved. Uh, are you in favour of, of an early uh, hearing in these terms? Well, um I, I can see that there could be merit in, in, in uh, as it were, a process in which the, um, the, the, the Crown requires to keep people informed. I suppose the question in my mind is whether, whether the Crown is not doing that anyway. One would, be, one would be concerned if the Crown wasn't keeping uh, uh, those most intimately concerned are, are apprised of, of, of where they were, and if there is going to be a significant delay in the start of an inquiry, why, the, why that's the case. Mm -hmm. yes. yes, I'd like to come in on that, if I may, Madam Chairman. Um, I agree in principle with the, the, the idea of an early hearing. Um, I read Lord Cullen's evidence to the committee with, with great interest. It seems to me that... Um, Having an early hearing takes the matter entirely, or it doesn't leave the matter entirely within the hands of the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service. It brings the court into play at an early stage, and therefore it gives the court an element of control of the pace at which matters happen in future, and that must be an important thing. Um, Parliament has recently legislated on court reform, and one of the principles that lay behind Lord Gill's recommendations was that, part, that litigants should not be allowed to litigate at their own pace. And it seems to me that that principle could equally apply to fatal accident inquiries, giving the court the power at the start to keep an eye on things and make sure that matters are moving forward is extremely important. Um, if I could perhaps add to that, another suggestion from um, Lord Cullen was that the Crown Procurator Fiscal Service should be properly resourced and, in fact, almost a fatal accident inquiry unit created. But I believe in the evidence then he said that was almost the case just now. It was in the deaths unit. But the key point being it should be properly resourced to make sure that that wasn't a factor in any unnecessary de delays. Well... If I could come back on that one too, it seems to me that there is almost a conflict of interest for the Procurator Fiscal, um, because the public interest in having a prosecution is not the same as the public interest in having an inquiry which is there to learn lessons for the future. Those two things are entirely distinct, and therefore if the, the Crown is to remain in charge of both aspects, separating the responsibility within the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service would, in my view, be a good thing. Yeah, that's helpful. We haven't heard that aspect before. That's interesting. Um, do, you, do, do you wish to comment on that, Mr Wolfe? No. Well, it's plainly essential that the COPFS is, COPFS is appropriately resourced to be able to handle uh, its, its responsibilities. Um, leading on from that, from really what you've just said, Mr Marshall, then there has been an issue about legal aid and whether the reasonableness test should still apply. Um, it's been ruled out of the bill, it seems, primarily on financial grounds, but the same point was made about the Crown Procurator Fiscal's representation. Well, in my opinion, it is important that um, families are represented um, in some cases, obviously, in some workplace um, accidents, uh, 
there may be support from a trade union, but in other circumstances that um, financial backing may not be available. Um, in my own experience, um, in particular with the helicopter inquiry last year, um, the, the families wanted to bring forward a number of different issues which didn't seem to be on the agenda from uh, the Procurator Fiscal. Without the support of the trade union movement, those issues could not have been aired at all, or might not have been aired at all. So it is very important. And uh, again, referring back to what Lord Cullen said to the committee a fortnight ago, um, it seems to me he's hit exactly the right note. Okay, thank you. Um, I was just going to let somebody else in, Margaret, yes. to issue uh, that. Elaine, uh, uh, Rod, you may have a supplementary right, if you're not. Point, it's just a different point. A different point. So I'll just put you on my list. Elaine. Right, uh, thank you, Convener. Um, the bill puts many of Lord Cullen's recommendations into practice, but not all of them. So I particularly wanted to ask about uh, his recommendation that people who die when they're in the care of the state, if you like, children uh, in care or those det detained under mental health legislation, uh, what your views were uh, on whether there should be mandatory F FAIs in those circumstances and whether the bill actually does meet our human rights obligations? We, um, we've expressed the view that the scope for mandatory inquiry, the scope of the mandatory inquiry uh, requirement should be expanded um, to cover the category of children who are not in secure accommodation but are in residential um, uh, establishments um, under the Children's Scotland Act and the Social Work Scotland Act. Um, I've also read with some interest the submission of the Equality and Human Rights Commission and it, it does strike me that this is an issue which the government perhaps should think uh, again about. Um, the there are perhaps two elements to this. One is the requirement on the state where there is a death and either whether one puts it uh, a death in custody or a death of someone who's in in the care of the state mm. that, 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 that there is at least the potential for human rights obligations to kick in with a series of procedural requirements, um, including a requirement of, 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 of public scrutiny. So um, perhaps without wanting to commit myself to a, 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 a stark proposition that the bill doesn't comply with our human rights mm -hmm. conventions, it does seem to me that there is a need mm -hmm. for the government to look very carefully at those categories of cases and whether the mandatory inquiry um, provision is drawn broadly enough. And perhaps lest there be concern that um, to expand the scope of the mandatory inquiry is to impose pressure on the system of inquiries, I go back to the point I made earlier that in, in an inquiry where the facts are straightforward and uncontroversial, um, what one is securing by having an inquiry is that there is an element of public scrutiny through the responsibility of the sheriff of what the COPF has done by way of their own inquiries, but it doesn't take up or needn't take up large amounts of yeah. court time. It would just perhaps establish that it wasn't controversial, but that's important well, as well. As uh, and that in itself, is, uh, of in, indeed, is. convener, that in itself may be important. Mr Marshall. I don't think I have anything to add to that. I, I agree. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Well, by, um, uh, my colleague Patricia Ferguson has, has proposed that uh, in her own proposal for a member's bill that... It's the same point. Uh, it's, it's about mandatory FAIs, yes. That's okay, because yes. I've, yeah. got, I've got supplementaries yeah. on children. In, is it... Be remembered, no, it's, 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 is it's, it's this about, about children? children? Well, that's okay, a separate, that's separate, separate one. So well, I'll come to that. Know, Elaine, well... <laughs> no, I'll, I'll take your... You go on, Elaine. Part, I'll yeah. take you later. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the extension of mandatory FAIs to deaths called, caused by industrial diseases or exposure to hazardous sub substances. Have you a view on that, whether... Well, as someone who practices in the area of uh, industrial disease day and daily, um, 
I, my, my personal view is that there would be value in having inquiries in certain circumstances. Um, although, it, it, particularly in the case of asbestos, the events which gave rise to the illness and death will have happened many, many years ago. There are still a, a, number of, a considerable number of cases coming forward which involve organisations which are still in existence. And uh, public bodies, for example, national, or former nationalised industries, and the working practices which gave rise to the recent development of an asbestos-related disease may still be going on. They may not be affecting the individual who's now developed the disease, but they may affect others who are currently working in the same environment. And there may be some value in holding an inquiry um, from time to time in perhaps slightly unusual circumstances where the mere fact of the inquiry would promote uh, better working practices among those who are dealing with dangerous substances. Mm -hmm. yeah. I wonder whether the matter is not adequately dealt with by the provision for discretionary inquiries. Yes. Mr. It's implicit in what Mr. Marshall said, said that, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. um, there may be cases from time to time where an inquiry is justified um, in the case of a death through industrial disease. And I don't for a moment dissent from that, but uh, I, I'd suggest that that's dealt with by the opportunity for there to be a discretionary inquiry, which of course under the bill is uh, fortified by the um, requirement on the Lord Advocate on request to give reasons if he chooses not to have an inquiry in a particular uh, case. Um, I, I'd be concerned about putting all cases of industrial disease into the mandatory inquiry uh, category, uh, 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 partly because of the um, potential for the death to take place long after the exposure but also because uh, if one's dealing with a case where there's multiple exposures um, and, and, and the consequences of that, there may be a, 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 a series of deaths which effectively raise the same issue. Now, that may be a good reason for having a, a discretionary inquiry in those circumstances, but to have to have a mandatory inquiry in each case might be thought to be uh, uh, not necessary. And there's also Section 8 reasons for decision not to hold an inquiry in those circumstances and I can't recall I don't think it's in the bill but obviously someone's got to request that but is there provision, should there be provision perhaps, I don't think it's in the bill for someone to challenge the reasons why the Crown does not hold an inquiry once those written reasons have been provided well, well precedent for that um, without any without the need for any provision a, a judicial review yeah but that's a cumbersome procedure isn't it is it not no it's not but essentially that but <laughs> essentially that would be the the, the, the means by should which there be something in here so I'm saying that might be more potent and, and efficacious hmm. Well, d just to pick up on, on, on um, Tom's point about the current position, um, current position is the Crown's, if the Crown refuses to have an FAI, judicial review can be brought. Um, the requirement to give reasons um, will enable the justification given by the Crown to be scrutinised by the court in judicial review. Now, the grounds of review are, are limited. One would have to be able to show that the Crown had gone wrong in its understanding of the law or that there was some other um, uh, aspect to the decision which made it um, uh, unreasonable in a, in, a, in a technical sense. Um, the cases that have been brought have tended to focus on convention rights um, and whether the Crown has adequately reflected um, Article 2 in the decision not to hold an FAI and one can scrutinise the circumstances and if the Crown has decided not to hold an FAI where Article 2 requires them to do so then the court can intervene. Um, it's, a, I suppose, ultimately a matter of policy whether um, one wants to have a more intrusive scrutiny of the um, reasoning given by the Crown um, 
judicial review is a the parameters of judicial review depend on showing that the Crown has acted unlawfully or in, in the technical sense unreasonably. Um, and I suppose the question is whether there ought to be some, um, uh, in effect, appeal process where somebody independent reviews the Crown's decision. Yes. Um, I, I don't have a view one way or the other on that. Um, uh, I'm inclined to think that it would um, add a potential layer of... Um, of um, complexity, but I, I, I don't have a particular view to advance. I'm wondering here, uh, Madam Chairman, whether this could actually fit in with the early hearing proposal. Mm -hmm. If the court is seized of, of matters at an earlier stage and subsequently there's a decision taken by the Lord Advocate that, they should, that the, the inquiry should not proceed further, then mm -hmm. the court would already have the matter in front of it and would be in a position to oversee the decision not to hold an inquiry in those circumstances. Um, do, do you follow me? I follow you, but I'm just thinking that word oversee. Where did that take you? I mean, well, is to, it going to, to be in to a over, position or to, to overrule it? To overrule it. Well, that, well that, that's different, isn't that, it? That's that, would be, that, would be, yes. that would be the direction. Ah, so it's worth exploring it anyway, yes. rather than sit with the status quo. That's all I was wondering about. So, no, I understood the word oversee, but just meant you can oversee and then not do anything. <laughs> <laughs> it's overseeing and then doing something. I want to keep with the mandatory uh, FAIs, which you were going to ask about. And Christian, what were you, were you, is it mandatory? So let's keep to the category of what should be mandatory or not mandatory, just for this spell. Jane, please, convener. Morning. Um, I'd like to refer to evidence that was given on the 5th of May, and it's about um, people who are subject to mental health detention committing suicide. And in the context of an FAI being a means of, of le learning lessons and, and hoping to prevent or minimise the risk of reoccurrence, do you think that FAI should be mandatory when, when people who are subject to mental health detention commit suicide? Well, would the, would the, would the point not be that it should be mandatory for anyone who's in, in mental health detention for there to be a, a, an inquiry. My own view is that the law should err in favour of having mandatory inquiries with the option to opt out at the discretion of the Lord Advocate, rather than having discretionary inquiries which have to be opted into. Um, That's it, great. Thank and, you. And, and the mental health situation is one such where, in my opinion, that is the way the law should go. Yeah, I would agree. <laughs> <laughs> That's nice to know. <laughs> I would agree. <laughs> Mr Wolfe, do you wish to comment? Well, as I said earlier, having particularly read the Mandatory. evidence of the Equality and Human Rights Commission, um, I, I have to say I think there is an issue that needs to be looked at again by the government to, uh, in, in precisely the kind of situation that you're describing. Thank you. Thanks, Convener. This is on, are you on mandatory? Well, just on from James yes, Coyne. please, and then I've got yeah. Gil. Yes. Um, the government in the policy memorandum um, on this issue of uh, mental health debts uh, refer to the graduated scale of investigations in the Royal College of Psychiatrists. I don't know if you have the chance to see that in the policy memorandum, but paragraphs 116 and 17. Any, I've raised that last week with witnesses, but any general comments on that as an alternative? I, I did. I, I read yeah. that uh, note in the policy memorandum, and I also read the evidence that was given um, yeah. by the, the mental health witnesses. Was that just last week? Yeah. Um, well, I think for the reasons I, I've already given, I still favour the view that it's better to have an opt-out situation than an opt-in. Okay. Which Ms Baxter agrees with, so you're all right there. <laughs> <laughs> So you don't wish to comment that, no? I think the only point perhaps is this, that um, if the facts are uncontroversial, um, then the inquiry process will be relatively short and formal, but nevertheless fulfils an important public function in terms of the yes. um, public e exposure of, 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 of what has happened. It seems it continues the thread of when in the custody of the state in prison or in care, residential care or under some kind of mental welfare legislation. It seems that principle, would you say that should apply wherever it's the care of the state 
um, your mandatory care of the state under a statute or whatever, or order of the court, that there should be at least an opt out of an FAI rather than opt in yeah. as a general principle. Yes, I think that's, that's right. That's where we're going. Okay, thank you. Christian, you've been on my... Oh, Gil, sorry, I beg your pardon. My question is in relation to industrial diseases, and I wonder if you had any idea if it was compulsory to have an F FAI on industrial disease, how many would that uh, how many would that be in contrary to uh, the opposite view of that if it was discretionary how, how many is that likely to be and what is the kind of cost that we're talking about here and my, my main reason is that particularly with uh, asbestos that uh, one of the, the one of the campaigns that's forever running is the compensation that's available to those sufferers and victims of it and would this if we went down the line of having an automatic FEI, would that impact on them, or is it separate from it? Well, it, 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 perhaps I could answer that. First of all, the, the inquiry procedure doesn't have anything to do with compensation other than it may uh, allow evidence to be brought out, which would be useful uh, for other purposes, such as uh, a claim for compensation or indeed the prosecution of someone. Um, as far as numbers are concerned, um, the, the number of mesothelioma deaths in Scotland is more than 200 a year now. Um, there are also um, lung cancer cases which may or may not be related to asbestos exposure. So there are, many, there are potentially many hundreds of, of cases. Um, however, um, even if there was a mandatory requirement to hold an inquiry, there is still the option to opt out. Now, it may be that for the reasons that have already been explored this morning, and indeed I think in previous sessions, that it's unrealistic to have a mandatory inquiry in every case of industrial disease, um, and that the better course for those kind of cases would actually be to select the opt-in approach and select those cases where there is genuinely some new issue to be explored which it would be worth exploring for wider reasons of health and safety, which would have lessons, which would ring uh, in industry today, uh, and not just to establish the facts of what happened in the past. I, I certainly would, was aware that it wouldn't lead to any compensation, but I, I'm thinking about the system itself. If, if uh, more uh, uh, inquiries were held, on an automatic basis when there may not be a need, since we, we already know what the cause is and we've probably got it in the medical record, that it would actually add cost at that end in the system. Uh, you know, it's finite amounts of money and pressure might come on down the line. And I, you know, some believe that the, the area where the cost should be borne is uh, looking for compensation. We know what caused death, we know that people are carrying it, but, you know, it's the compensation end that whereas I think it is where the pinch point is in, in, in some people's minds. Well, I, I know that the, the government has been, or, or members has, have certainly been looking at, at uh, recovering the cost of uh, health care for uh, industrial disease sufferers, um, a potentially controversial area in itself. Um, I'm not sure that I can really add a, a great deal more. The, the no doubt is a cost in holding an inquiry. The question really must be whether that expenditure is worthwhile in, in looking forward as much as looking back, because in my view, that is what an inquiry really is about. It's looking forward to, to try and prevent the same circumstances happening again so far as possible allowing people to learn lessons and adopt different practices. Um, and so if it could be seen that an inquiry into events maybe long in the past would still have lessons for today and the future, then that would be money well spent, in my view. Thanks for that. Thanks, Camilla. Christian. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Just a couple of points. First of all, on deaths abroad, um, I... I see that uh, there is a limitation, of course, uh, on uh, Section 6. The person's body has been brought to Scotland. Uh, is there exceptional circumstances 
that uh, that could occur uh, for a death happening abroad, uh, but it's not possible for a reason or another not to have uh, the body recovered and sent back to Scotland. Do you think we, the bill should maybe reflect on this? I have to confess it's not an issue that I've thought about and I don't have an immediate view um, to express. I'm not sure that I, I, I've got anything very useful to add on, on this subject either. Perhaps I, if you think about and write to us later yes. about it. I mean, yes. I think the committees of the view, we wonder why you need to bring back a body when there be circumstances that it's just impossible, but you might still have an FAI. So rather than ask you to chew over just now, we'll um, it, ask you to write to us once you've reflected on that one. Yes. It would be great if you could. Uh, and the other point will be uh, what you wrote in your, uh, uh, in your submission uh, from the Faculty of Advocates uh, regarding the location of such an inquiry taking place. Um, I see that you express the view that it should maybe be in the face of the bill that uh, it would take place locally. Uh, but we see in the, uh, uh, in the explanatory notes uh, on section uh, par, uh, section 12.43, uh, 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 that is indeed expected that the majority of uh, this inquiries will be held in the same sheriffdom as a place of death. I, I don't really understand why, what kind of amendment would you like to see uh, in the face of it? And is there really a need for, for this amendment? Is it more in the spirit? Or? Yes, I think the particular point that's been raised um, is what, that one of the reasons why uh, it's a good idea for inquiries to be held locally is the accessibility of the inquiry to those who are most intimately affected, particularly the families or, or, or the family of, of uh, the deceased, but also witnesses um, who, who may have to travel to give evidence to the inquiry. Um, there are, of course, circumstances in which the um, death occurs at a location which is not where the deceased live, not where the family is. So, so the first of those is not always uh, a compelling factor. I think we recognize that uh, it is a good thing to put flexibility into the system to allow inquiries to be held at an appropriate place, which may not always be the local sheriff. To, I think our particular concern is that the decision-making process should take into account the interests and views of uh, particularly the family. Um, and it may be that that could be built in by way of an, an amendment. Uh, I notice, for example, that um, it, at, at section uh, 12, where the sheriff uh, makes an order transferring the proceedings to uh, a sheriff of another sheriffdom, he has to give participants in the inquiry an opportunity to make representations. Now, the family, is, family will not always be participants in the inquiry, and one could add in a requirement that the family be, 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 be given the opportunity to um, make representations, and equally where the Lord Advocate under 12.2 uh, is choosing the sheriff in which proceedings are to be held, there could be a, a requirement on him to take into account the wishes and interests of the family. Uh, I'm not suggesting those can always be determinative because there may be a range of factors, but at least an obligation to take those interests into account um, could be added to the face of the bill. Well, that answers the question regarding the side of the families. I doesn't really but uh, do you think the sheriff principle should, be, should have a greater role? into that location. Do you think that the sheriff should as well, um, you know, kind of defend the own sheriff principle of the area, should, should kind of defend that the location should be held locally? Yes. Well, as I read the pr provisions in Section 12, the Lord Advocate chooses the sheriff to... Um, but the sheriff, uh, sheriff may also make an order transferring proceedings. And sorry, I, I, I misread it. I said sheriff principal in error. I see it's the sheriff. That, that's sheriff. my mistake. No, no, I'm, I'm just thinking. But you know, maybe the sheriff principal will be seen as being excluded from the from the process. No. Um, uh, one one way of dealing with that would simply be to um, put in the interpretation section that sheriff includes sheriff principal in section 38 I mean it, it, in practical terms the, the 
the sheriff principal would be involved would because be. he's managing the business yes, in, the within business the sheriff. Yeah. So, so, in other words, it maybe not need to, to add it up, but I, I take your point that uh, some, some section could be added on, like they are in section 12, in section 6. Thank you very much. For it. And it, if, if we were to look at this early hearing raised by Margaret Mitchell, that might be a very issue that could be, apart from putting the face of the bill, that families or relatives be consulted, that that would be a matter again, because it might be appropriate that it's held uh, in a different sheriffdom, uh, and, and, but families would know why. Thank you. Um, I now have Rod, followed by Alison, please. Thank you, convener. Um, Lord Cullen, when he gave evidence on the 5th of May, indicated that he thought the purpose of a fatal accident inquiry is for the purpose of inquisition, not for the purposes of establishing rights, duties and obligations. Uh, in that context, in terms of the status of the Sheriff's recommendations, uh, would you have concerns about recommendations being binding? And what's your view on how we approach sheriff's recommendations? Yes, I, I think our view is that the sheriff's recommendations should not be binding. And we take that view for a, a number of reasons. Um, the first is that um, ultimately, um, the, let's say it's a recommendation to change a particular system or to change a particular um, policy approach by a public authority, ultimately the responsibility for making policy, if it's a public authority, having a, an appropriate system of work if it's a private employer, falls on the public authority or the employer. Um, and while one would expect any responsible public authority or private body <coughs> to take very seriously a recommendation from a sheriff following an FAI, there may be considerations which have not been quite properly are not brought within the ambit of the particular circumstances of the particular death but which are properly taken into account in deciding what is the right thing to do um, and I think for that reason of, of principle it would be wrong to make the recommendations binding it would also I think have a material impact on the nature of the inquiry process because if the recommendations are to be binding then the stakes are all the all the higher for um, uh, those who might be affected by recommendations who might not indeed be participants of the inquiry might be other bodies maybe um, who are not immediately involved um, and that could lead to the um, inquiry process becoming a more difficult, protracted and adversarial one um, because if a recommendation is going to be binding, then it, 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 it really matters to those who are going to be affected by that recommendation that they, they deal with all the issues within the confines of the inquiry. It's a conundrum. Um, a very difficult one to answer. Um, on the one hand, you have what is a public judicial inquiry. Witnesses may be compelled to attend. They give evidence under oath. Submissions are made on behalf of interested parties, and the sheriff makes a detailed and reasoned determination. And at the end of that, should it just disappear in a puff of smoke? And that is clearly a, a major concern. But on, on the other hand, I, I have some sympathy with what James has said, that it, it's difficult to, say, to, to see that if you make recommendations binding, that that will in fact alter the entire nature of the inquiry process. One of the values of the inquiry process is the fact that it, it ought to be an open um, inquiry where people are not taking sides or should not be taking sides. The object is to get the facts out into the open and get as much information there so that lessons can be learned. But how, do you, how then do you ensure that the lessons which have been learned are acted upon? Yeah, that really brings me on to my next yeah. question. Um, if we accept that for the moment, how do we improve you know, the, the response um, to 
such recommendations ensure that proper regard is had to them? Has the bill got it right? Well, it, 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 I agree that, um, they sh that people to whom recommendations are directed should respond and that those responses should be publicised. That, that is the very least that uh, should happen, so that it is put on record what the response is. People will then be able to see whether it is likely that the recommendations are acted upon. That may have an impact if events occur in future where recommendations have been made, uh, responses have been of one sort or another, and matters repeat, that may have an impact for the victims of a, of a, of a subsequent event. Um, but in terms of actually formally binding people t to do certain things, I think that, that's where the difficulty lies. I can just uh, add some comments. I suppose the other way in which uh, uh, making the recommendations binding would affect the nature of the process is that I suspect sheriffs would become much more cautious about the recommendations that they make because what may seem sensible in the light of the tragic circumstances of an individual case um, may, for very proper reasons, when looked at across uh, uh, in a more in a broader context, may, may may be something that it's not appropriate to to uh, to implement. For that reason, it seems to me that the balance has been struck appropriately in the bill, um, because those to whom recommendations have been directed are, as I understand it, to be expected to respond to the recommendation, they will, one would expect, if, if, they, if a decision is made not to implement a recommendation, they will no doubt wish to explain uh, why. Um, and that requirement in and of itself to consider a response ought to have an impact on those to whom recommendations are, are directed. I think there's a there's an inter there's a question perhaps about whether um, the process procedure for publication through the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service is just exactly the right way to go about it. But the the broad thrust of what is um, of the policy reflected in the bill seems to me to be uh, to get that balance right. Is is there an alternative to the use of the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service? I suspect that may be, be the problem. I mean, uh, I, well, on one view, um, perhaps it could be done through a separate Scottish government, um, through the Scottish government, but I, I don't have a particular answer to the question, but I recognise that there is an issue that's been raised about uh, that body being the body which um, takes responsibility for the publication of these matters. It does, it does have the advantage that if people are looking for information about fatal accident inquiries, then probably they're going to go to the Scottish Court's website. And uh, if they had to go somewhere else to find out information about recommendations that, that have been made and responses that have been given, then um, the, the prospect is that they're not going to find it, or at least the Scottish Court's website is going to have to put up a link. So work is going to have to be done somewhere by the Scottish Court service. Um. Okay. Thank you. I, I, accepting what you say about you would completely or significantly change the nature of an FAI if you make recommendations mm. enforceable. Um, it does, however, seem unsatisfactory that they're made, somebody has to reply in writing or to say to the tri tribunal service why they're not complying in full, and that's it. Is there any way that there could be something within the bill whereby a recommendation given, and we go through the process here, but the tribunal service is not satisfied with the response 
uh, from the party or uh, parties set about complying, they can make something enforceable or do further process. Because it does seem simply to publicise it and say, this is the recommendation. I, mean, I understand there could be further criminal or civil proceedings or whatever, and there would be a kind of pressure to do it. But nevertheless, it does seem after an FAI, and I understand not in all cases could you make a recommendation enforceable for various reasons we've had previously. So not some way one can ensure there's more push to ensure that there's compliance, in part, in, even if it's only in part that's with all the whole within here, within section 27. You know, where, where the tribunal service can look at it, well, we're not happy about this. Well, I think, I think the problem that one would then have is, is the w w one involves, well, the question you say is who in the tribu court tribunal service is it envisaged that one puts it back before a sheriff who has some monitoring role uh, over the um, way in which a recommendation is implemented or not implemented. Um, if, if, if it is a sheriff who has that role, what sanction is one ultimately going to be applying other than the sanction of, 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 of public opinion um, or the pressure that comes from being forced at least to confront the recommendation and make a, mm. a, a response to it? I, I think one shouldn't lose sight of the fact that the what an inquiry, a judicial inquiry, is very good for, very good at, is making determinations about what has happened, what has caused the death, what failings have there been in systems of work and the like. The question of what needs to be done in order to put things right is a, is a much broader yeah. question. It's not, it's not a simple question of applying, no. uh, uh, working out what the facts are and applying the law to the facts. It's a, a, an exercise of deciding what a policy response should be if we're talking about a public authority or uh, how, a, how a private enterprise ought to change its systems. And that's, a, that's a, almost, particularly one's talking about um, public authorities, almost a quasi-legislative uh, role. Now, sheriffs are, in our current system, free to and do make recommendations about changes that they think emerge from the, the facts of the case. But at the end of the day, it has to be for the body concerned to consider the thing at large and to decide, um, decide for itself what its responsibilities are. Could I suggest... One, one option here would be to make the response back to the sheriff rather than to the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service, mm -hmm. and that the inquiry proceedings themselves would not close until the response had been received. That's helpful. I just think at the moment people must wonder when a recommendation is made that there's, that's it. Um, I understand the reasons you've given, but I think for families and so on, it, it, and the public, but don't understand why it can't be tougher. Patricia. Thank you, convener. It's, it's on that very point. Good morning, gentlemen. Clearly, at the moment, sheriffs can make recommendations. And there have been occasions when sheriffs have made recommendations that, if they had been followed, would have prevented future incidents. And by incidents, we're talking here necessarily about the loss of life. So in a circumstance where a sheriff chooses to make a recommendation and feels strongly enough that that recommendation would, in all probability, prevent future uh, fatalities or casualties, should there not be a mechanism whereby that sheriff can say so and have a sanction that they can apply if that uh, recommendation is not carried out? Well, I, I was thinking, uh, as you were talking there, um, that of the case movingly discussed last week with, by Louise Taggart of her brother and um, one can see that, that uh, where some step could be taken to protect electricians in, in the work that they were doing had been publicised, that further lives would not have been lost. I, I, I don't know enough about the details, but I suspect that all of the electricians 
who subsequently, who lost their lives after Louise Taggart's brother, were not all employed by the same people. And therefore, the recommendation, had there been one uh, in a fatal accident inquiry at an earlier stage, would have to have been acted upon not only by Mr. Adamson's employers, but also by the employers of the other men mm -hmm. who subsequently lost their lives. Um, now, in, had, the, had those men still lost their lives, notwithstanding a recommendation, then the sanction would surely be for the Crown to prosecute those who had failed to take the appropriate measures to protect those other men, rather than for um, there to be some follow-up from the fatal accident inquiry which had been held into the death of Mr. Adamson. Um, one would be introducing a, a new breed of, of sanction almost, um, the limits of which would be ill-defined. Um, you know, the, the, as I indicated, it is a conundrum, but um, that may that imperfect situation may be the best that can be achieved. I understand that the reason for an FEI may vary, or the circumstances of the, the, the case that causes the FEI may vary, um, but I can, you know, that's one example. I would refer you to the case of the Newton and Belgrove train crashes, both of which were caused by uh, drivers passing signals that told them not to pass. Yes. And at the first of those fatal accident inquiries, the sheriff quite clearly said that if there was a system of double blocking, in other words, two signals that had to be passed before such a danger would be encountered, that that would be a good thing to be to happen as a result of that fatal accident inquiry. That recommendation was ignored. And four years later, the same thing happened again. Now, it seems to me there's not much point in having a fatal accident inquiry if all that you do is find out what happened and don't learn the lessons from it. So I would suggest that a sheriff being able to make a recommendation when he or she feels it's appropriate uh, is, is something that really does need to be considered at this stage. I, I, I agree entirely that, the, as I've indicated, that the finding, the, finding the correct solution, one that works in law, um, is the difficulty. Mm. I'd perhaps just say that I, I agree entirely that one of the purposes of the inquiry is to learn lessons. Um, if there's a failure by somebody to whom a recommendation is directed to follow that recommendation and further lives are lost, then as, as Tom said earlier, that, that may be relevant in the context of subsequent decisions that might be made to prosecute or, or indeed I suppose in questions of civil liability. Um, so it may not be ent entirely without sanction. Um, yeah, I, I accept in law that's the case, but in practical terms, shouldn't we be trying to prevent further loss of life rather than prosecuting people when it happens? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. yep. But I think even in law, I think, is it not possible, as Ms Ferguson's positing, that a sheriff could make a recommendation, not just in relation to the employer or whatever there, but at large, as in the circumstances described, if, if it's a... a a practice that's prevalent throughout that that recommendation because of its very nature should be enforceable yes. well i think you know if we take that yes, yes. i know you made a really good po very yes. important point there and that's that would be in law it wouldn't be just because it's morally correct well i i, I think in a way that perhaps points up the conundrum which I think we probably all grapple with in relation to this, that if the sheriff is making a recommendation that's going to have a binding effect on people at large or at a group of people who are not represented before the inquiry, then one has a real problem about how, how the interests of those people are, are taken into account or any view 
views they might wish to express are taken into account before the recommendation mm. uh, is made. Okay, and inquiry. one does see sometimes recommendations which are along the lines of consideration should be given to the issuing of guidance or the, 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 a change of a policy or, or whatever it might be. And sheriffs may well be framing their recommendation in that way, deliberately recognising and correctly recognising that you know, it, it may be for, let's say, a, 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 a trade body to consider whether a, a, they should be issuing guidance to their members. It may be for government to take forward in certain ways. And it's actually wrong for the sheriff to be unduly prescriptive about the outcome of that because there are other parties whose interests need to be taken into account. I, I, I'm not convinced, uh, <laughs> I, I, although I praised you once before for being very convincing versus the Lord Advocate, um, but surely if it were the case that, as, as Ms Ferguson says, there was a wider application and the Sheriff could see this coming, mm -hmm. then it would be possible, would it not, in an FAI for the Sheriff to continue the proceedings to allow representations as he pondered or she pondered the recommendation to make representations before issuing, you know, a, a, an enforceable recommendation. If you're telling me that's the problem, they weren't party to the FAI, but you have very special cases where you perfectly well can see that this requires general application. Would it not be possible to do that so you could have an enforceable recommendation but give other parties the opportunity to make representations before doing it? Or is that just a mess? The, the, the answer ought to be really some method of translating the recommendation into a new law. Um, well, that takes so, time. Well, that takes time, in, which in, isn't in, on the. No, I, 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 but that that is mu it's much tidier uh, in Aye. terms of. It's tidier, but is, we're in is, the same position as Ms. Ferguson explained. People die. Yes. And you don't want to get time for letting people die. No. Nope. Uh, well, I'll leave the faculty in the, to think of a solution. To, I think we'd like a solution here. Um, greater brains than ours, and that's um, Alison. Just to pursue a bit further, I mean, Lord Collins' original proposal envisaged the Scottish Government being much more involved in overseeing the implementation of responses. It seems to me that um, if, if responses are not implemented, it's likely to be because... Um, there's a lot of knock-on effects that haven't yet been worked through, and, and it's quite complex. That policy making should be done either at local government level by elected members or, or in, in, in this parliament. And therefore, is there not a role that we could work out for the, the Scottish government to conduct a, an annual review of those recommendations that were not taken up to see whether there are patterns or anything? Should we be um, imposing something on the government to do? at the end of this process, because you could imagine what you're suggesting would go on forever if, if people started to feed back in that they, they would be affected by a recommendation, but they hadn't been considered. Mm. Mm. And therefore, it wouldn't be a tidy system at all. Yeah, I, I, I think the general thrust of the approach that we uh, agree with is that um, the right balance is a process that involves reporting. Yeah. Now, if that reporting process can be made more robust and effective um, you know, through a requirement um, on government or, or others to um, collate information, make it available, then you know, that would be that would go with the grain, I think, of the the kind of approach that we are advocating. Um, I haven't thought specifically yes, about yeah. a solution, but yes. I, I, I I can see that if if the basic principle is that reporting is the right way to go mechanisms which make the reporting process transparent and robust uh, mm -hmm. would be entirely consistent with that. Okay. John. Uh, thank you, um, Convener. Uh, mor morning, panel. Um, I'd like to talk uh, briefly about participants. Um, it's covered in uh, Section 10 uh, of the legislation. <clears throat> where, where there's, there's a list, and then it, it, Section D is very specific about uh, where the death is within Section 2.3, and that relates to acting in the course of the individual's employment or occupation. And it lists two there. It lists the employer uh, and it also lists an inspector under Health and Safety at Work Act. Should it also list a trade union or staff association representative? Yes. 
My kind answer. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. you waited a long time. Yeah, yes. Well, well I, I do have a, a follow-on, if I may, please, uh, to the panel. And, and that relates to, to information we've had that suggests that Section 10 is open to abuse, if not properly regulated. Indeed, the suggestion is that uh, a subsection be, should be drafted as to allow the sheriff to limit in advance the issues in an FAI upon which any participant should be entitled to adduce evidence and the issues that such a participant should be ad addressed in making submissions. Indeed, uh, there's a further suggestion that these should be provided written notice of the topics of one which they wish to cross-examine examine and cross-examine any witness. Do, do you have a view on that at all, please? The general thrust of, of um, civil justice reform is in the direction of, of sheriffs and judges taking a much more um, active role in managing cases before them. And um, I don't myself um, ha have any difficulty with the notion that the sheriff um, manages an inquiry by uh, asking the participants to identify the issues they particularly want to raise and um, the sheriff being in a position to, in effect, um, dis determine the issues that ought to be in inquired into. Um, I think there's a balance to be struck about how far that goes and, and, and how far um, in an individual case the sheriff will consider it right to confine um, uh, parties in the way they wish to approach uh, their involvement as participants. But the principle of, of uh, Shrevel, um, as it were, management of the process seems to me to be a sound one. The, the answer, in my view, is in the preliminary hearing, as opposed to the early hearings which we've been discussing beforehand. Um, if the preliminary hearing system works well, then everybody should know by the time the inquiry starts what issues are to be explored. Um, everyone will be able to give you war stories and horror stories of inquiries that have run out of control like a runaway train um, because um, topics emerge as the inquiry goes along new parties appear, other people want to ask questions, and the whole thing grows arms and legs, to mix many metaphors. Um, but if, if the scope of the inquiry is mapped out before it begins, then that's the stage at which people can make representations about the issues they want to explore, and these matters can then be the, the subject of agreement, and you know in advance what the inquiry is going to cover. Who should determine the scope of the inquiry then? The sheriff, after submissions from the interested participants. And what would be the avenue of redress for someone who wasn't happy with the terms of reference? Well, currently they would have to judicially review the decision of the sheriff. Okay, thanks very much indeed. Thank you. Uh, Rod, followed by Christian. Um, it's really a question for Mr Marshall um, on the question of the use of summary sheriffs which the bill provides for them to be potentially involved in fatal accident inquiry. Um, do you have a view on that? Um, I don't myself see any particular difficulty with a sheriff of, of any description hearing an inquiry. Um, the important factor must be whether the person is uh, sufficiently experienced and, and capable of dealing with a matter of this sort. Now, as the committee, I'm sure, is well aware, the, the qualifications to become a summary sheriff are exactly the same as the qualifications to become a sheriff and effectively practically the same as those to become a senator of the College of Justice. Um, it's difficult to imagine that people who apply for and are going to be appointed as summary sheriffs will be anything other than experienced solicitors or advocates uh, and it's also difficult to imagine that the sheriff principal would appoint someone who is not competent whether they be a summary sheriff or a sheriff to hear an inquiry so I don't myself see any particular difficulty I think there's a you know if it's a question of status simply then well perhaps that's something people should get over 
<laughs> right behind you, and they're sharpening, sharpening knives. Well, I, 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 <laughs> no, they're not. Obviously, I don't know whether summary sheriffs will be <laughs> admitted to the sheriffs' association. One, whether, whether there's to be a separate summary sheriffs' association. One hope that they're more collegiate than that, perhaps. <laughs> they're listening. <laughs> Any, you don't, don't wish to say, Mr. Wolf, do you? Right. In this? Yeah, I mean, we, 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 we've expressed yeah. a, 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 yes. a, 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 a reservation, yeah. which is, I think, around the question of how an inquiry will be perceived um, if it's before a, a, a summary sheriff with the, the jurisdiction of a summary sheriff. Uh, a little follow-up question is whether you think sheriffs should retain discretionary power to award expenses in FAIs, you know, under specific circumstances. Do you think they should? I see that the insurance companies are exercised about this matter. Um, uh, retaining a discretion to award expenses, it seems it's been very rarely exercised yes. in the past. Um, to rule it out of account altogether seems perhaps going too far. Yeah. Perhaps I can reflect on that and come back in writing. Yes, that's, thank you. That concludes my questions and thank you both very much for your evidence. I'll suspend for a couple of minutes to allow a changeover to allow the sheriffs to take their seats. <laughs>
are interested in what happens and what the outcome is going to be, and you would exclude those people from a very public inquiry if you were to place it somewhere else. Some inquiry could be very complicated and could be um, very much focused on a particular subject. We maybe need to have a shared if we should have this, uh, this expertise. Uh, but it seems that there is a, a, a complication regarding the process, the mechanism to see a way it should be held. Is there a conflict between sheriff principles and, and the way we, 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 will, we will see at the start? Uh, or the way we are consulted about the, the location? Well, currently, uh, that's not a, I'm not aware of that being an issue. I think what may be become a, a, a bit of concern in relation to this is the fact that the Lord Advocate is uh, effectively given the power to locate, in the first instance, the, uh, the, the fatal accident inquiry. And that, that may uh, give rise to concerns that the local aspect is perhaps overlooked in favour of... Uh, a more centralised view, and, and clearly that would give us some concern. No, I heard, on, I read on the submission that, however, in practice, uh, this can only be done with the consent of both sheriff principles involved. So, could we end up to having the contrary effect that you know uh, the, the, everything will stay local and there will be no reason for it to be by special scores or to be done somewhere else. Well, I, susp I suspect the, balance well, the, the difficulty is that's the second stage. The first stage is mm -hmm. that the Lord Advocate chooses yeah. where it goes. So that's really, I, I wonder if that is this effectively a safety net mm -hmm. to stop <laughs> uh, a, an avoidance of local localising the inquiry. I don't know. Um, but that in itself is a fairly potentially cumbersome procedure, which, again, we are not entirely relaxed about. I, I agree, and it's, that, it's difficult in some respects to understand how that would necessarily work, where a sheriff is making a recommendation, as it were, to the sheriff principal and both sheriff principals to try and alter what the sheriff thinks is uh, appropriate. You think the sheriff, sheriff principals will automatically try to, to, to have it uh, held locally? I don't think I can. I, I'm not. I wouldn't yeah, want I'm to make that assumption I I, because I can't see into the mind of a sheriff principal and what. Uh, yeah, I was more interested in was the me mechanism to think, you know, having a balanced way as much as possible and not have a presumption that it should be either held locally or either held, you know, uh, outside the, the, the local event. So it's, it's a difficult balance to strike. And but do you think it's not struck rightly as, as it is? It's difficult to see why it would be necessary to have a fatal accident inquiry out with the sheriffdom. Mm -hmm. If you have a provision that says that you can have an inquiry out with the court, mm -hmm. and so if you have a, you know, a rural uh, situation where the court isn't big enough, and we all know about the Orkney inquiry that took place many years ago, then of course you find a place where the inquiry can take place and you take the court to the building. Thank you very much for this answer. Another question would be, uh, in distribution of uh, Sheriff Principal and Murray, uh, we have, uh, regarding the clause of uh, uh, the repatriation of a body from death occurring abroad, uh, it seems that Sheriff uh, M Principal Murray is saying that there would maybe be a, a case for having a special uh, a change in the, in the bill to allow exceptional p uh, circumstances. Have you got any comment on this? I, th I think we have to say that that, that it, it does enter into the area of policy, and it's something that we don't think we should be commenting on. Thank you, Thank you very much. For I, just to return to a question that my colleague didn't ask, is I understand you raised concerns about the role of specialist sheriffs and summary sheriffs in presiding over FAIs. Why? Well, part of the reason is that um, we think that if, if there's a distinction between a sheriff and a summary sheriff, and I know the previous uh, the person giving evidence said that it's exactly the same um, criteria for appointment, but if that's the case, then why bother having sheriffs anymore? Let's just have summary sheriffs to do everything and don't have the uh, separate jurisdiction. But we do have the separate jurisdiction. We have privative jurisdiction under the 2014 Act. And, of course, you could turn the question on its head and say, why is that? Why do you have a, a, a privative jurisdiction? And the answer is because it's, so, it's thought that some things are more complex, which yes. is 
like misused or more serious to merit a sheriff rather than a summary sheriff. And summary sheriffs are meant to do, I, I don't mean to be disparaging, but more routine and perhaps easier things. There, I think there might be an expectation, first of all, in relation to uh, families and even individuals who come along to uh, inquiries, that there's going to be someone with experience and weight dealing with the inquiry. If you want an example of that, then look at what's happening in Glasgow at the moment, where the sheriff principal has decided to uh, hear the inquiry. The, I lost track of what I was going to well, say. Well, I was going to say that undermines your argument, if you forgive me saying, uh, Sheriff, because you're saying a determination has already been made that the inquiry in Glasgow is of such um, complexity and significance that it's a sheriff principle. It would seem that given that we have been told and we know that some FEIs are pretty straightforward, but they're mandatory oh, yes. because of the circumstances, why couldn't a summary sheriff do that if it's seen to be that? Um, and, and in the same way as you've already indicated, it was very complex. The sheriff principal is doing well, very straightforward. Could be a summary sheriff. Yes, and, and, and it does actually pick up on. The, <laughs> thank you for putting me back on track for what I was going to say. I, if something is uh, simple, and if something is going to be effectively lead to a formal finding, then it takes very little time to do that, oh, and it's not something that uh, would I, I accept. Not something that would require. Um, a sheriff principal to do. However, one doesn't know, one, you know, if one's assigned an inquiry to deal with, one doesn't know how complex or how serious that's going to be pretty well until you come to the preliminary hearing. And it's only then that um, you might be presented with uh, what parties think is straightforward and uh, realise that uh, no, it's not straightforward at all and it's going to require further investigation. Of course, we have powers to say we want to hear evidence in relation to one thing or another. And so the question would then be, who's the gatekeeper? But it's a question that might not have much uh, force behind it or much point to it, because if it's a simple matter, then it's not going to take a, sheriff's, a, a great deal of uh, shrivel time. It is an inquisitorial system that puts a lot of... Um responsibility on the sheriff, rightly so. It seems, I think, to us appropriate that the person exercising that responsibility has the experience and the confidence that comes with experience to direct, for example, investigations in a way that hasn't been anticipated. To, we all have experience of this happening. It happens not infrequently that uh, sheriffs see something in an apparently straightforward uh, case in which takes legs and it, it needs the experience to see it it needs the confidence to direct I it i appreciate that i think that's appreciated but it might be if we went the route of an early hearing that it'd be pretty clear that there, there are no i understand the unexpected can happen but it's one where a summary but let's move on because you're not happy about summary sheriffs mm -hmm. but you're not happy about specialist sheriffs it would seem to me that specialist sheriffs would be even better than um, ordinary sheriffs, non-summary sheriffs, dealing with something. Why are you unhappy about specialist sheriffs who will have this expertise uh, through dealing with this particular area day in, day out? Well, will they? Uh, both, both are additions to what was anticipated when both summary sheriffs and specialisation were mooted. There are new areas in which yes. these, these beasts are heading. So that, that, that's a decision that has to be reached, frankly, by, by you as to whether that's appropriate or not. We have reservations in that it does seem as if um, it may create the feeling in the public mind that there are important fatal accident inquiries and less uh, fatal accident inquiries of lesser importance that um, the decision is made when the Lord Advocate uh, assigns a, a, a fatal accident inquiry to a particular uh, sheriffdom and a, a particular sheriff takes it up, a summary, a part-time sheriff takes it up, that that may not get the attention that it would if a more experienced one gets it. The whole Act looks at, uh, at um, encourages 
uh, judicial management. That's a, a good thing. We're, we're yes. absolutely happy about that. But that demands skills. That demands experience. Now, of course, of course, anyone given the position will have training, and that's a, a good thing. But experience is harder to acquire. And I, I do come back to, to this concern that training goes hand in hand with confidence. Confidence to say to the Sheriff Principal, let's move this case out. This doesn't have a, a link with uh, this Sheriff, and let's put it somewhere else. Yeah. Confidence to get in touch with the other Sheriff Principal. All of these things put an enormous responsibility but on the Sheriff. We have judges specialising in the Court of Session, and I don't think people have problems with that. So I don't know why there should be problems with specialisation for sheriffs in particular cases that demand that. And I, I think that's un I understand that some cases are very complex and other ones are less complex. It doesn't mean it's diminishing uh, the inquiry. I just don't. I find it difficult with you when you say we can't have somebody sheriffs because, frankly. They're not in the same league, if I put it in well, terms. That, we're well, you're not wanting them to do it. But on the other hand, we're not going to have specialist ones because they would be another class. It's as if it's just got to be the one. Well, I, I, think, I, I think it's a more complex um, analysis than that because I think we're looking at the, the process, the process being one of hopefully having continuity of, of hearing. So there, there are particular difficulties. That, that process gets easier if you allocate a local sheriff to deal with it locally. That sheriff is in charge of the preliminary hearing, f follows it through, mm -hmm. guides it through, and, and, and to the very end. Now, that, that as a, as a, pro a court programming issue, yes. raises difficulties if you're importing part-time summary sheriffs, part-time sheriffs. It, it, all of that becomes more difficult. So there are these, there are these concerns. I'll leave it at that. Okay. Uh, 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 <laughs> you can see I'm not, fine way. I, I'm not convinced. <laughs> well, we have to keep in mind the size of our jurisdiction, because there are only 140 odd sheriffs in the whole of Scotland, and some of them are spread out all over the place. If you, if you were to select, I, I, it depends how specialists, so-called, are, are selected. Within the court that I sit in, it's Edinburgh Sheriff Court, we have enough sheriffs to have a number of specialisations. Yes. And so that, that means that that sheriff is probably more experienced dealing with that particular work because they do it on a rolling basis. Mm -hmm. If you were to make a number of specialist sheriffs in Scotland, specialist sheriffs, then it w they wouldn't be only that. They would have to have other duties as well yes. within their course. It would probably lead to something which I think is undesirable, and that's specialist centres, and would take away from the local aspect of inquiries. You know, where uh, Sheriff Stewart sits in Lark, there's um, what we call it a one and a half sheriff. Of course, you don't get a half sheriff, but it's because there's enough work for that. And uh, I, th I think it's fair to say you've dealt with a number of uh, FAIs. I, I, I very much doubt if specialisation were introduced that she would be designated a specialist sheriff. Mm -hmm. She wouldn't be able to be a specialist sheriff. However, she does deal with FAI. She deals with them locally. They have a local flavour. They have a local quality. And there's a, there's a point to that. I think that... Uh, the other thing I would say is, that as far as specialisation is concerned, sometimes that does mean that a sheriff, you know, for instance, the family sheriffs in, in Edinburgh yes. will do a, a run of specialisation. Uh, very recently, we had a pilot run in Edinburgh where we had um, domestic abuse sheriffs. That was rolled out. It came, the pilot came to an end, it was rolled out, and then we all became domestic abuse sheriffs. So we've all got the specialisation badge, but it simply means that we've all had the training for that. I don't know if that assists in no, the understanding it's, it's, of how it works. No, it's fair enough for you to put it there and for, for, for your position to be challenged. Mm. Um, it's a change challenging sheriffs. So you normally <laughs> don't challenge everybody else <laughs> until you went to be quiet. Alison, then Margaret, please. Thanks very much, Convener. I know you were both present when the previous panel was given evidence. Partially. Partially, but towards the end. And you would have heard the lengthy exchanges about sheriff's recommendations. Um, so um, it would be, of course, very important to hear your views on whether the proposals in the bill ensure that sheriff's recommendations go, uh, are taken seriously? Do you think it goes far enough as the bill is drafted at the moment? Uh, may I pick up on that? Uh, the nature of what we do as judges 
leads to us being functus at a point, and therefore what we've decided or what we've determined no longer becomes part of what we have control of. It would be very, very difficult if a sheriff had to maintain some sort of control over what happens and to try to case manage that in some way or to deal with inquiries coming back in. Or it, it, it would be almost impossible to do that. On the other side of that, I, I fully accept that if I make a recommendation, then I want it to be implemented and I expect it to be implemented. There's such a variety of things that can be, of recommendations that may come out of an inquiry that it's very difficult to, to be prescriptive in relation to that. But if, if you know, a couple of examples, perhaps. If, if, if on the back of an inquiry, I'm talking through personal experience, there's been medical negligence and that comes out, then that is likely to lead to the appropriate organisation making inquiries about that and perhaps you know in the most severe cases someone being struck off from practice if we take another example of a um, health and safety issue where there's an accident at work or something like that and that becomes disseminated the, the, the decision which i think is important if the uh, recommendation is disseminated then any em employer or, or organization business who knows about that, who's placed on notice about what, what came out of the, the inquiry and didn't implement it, would be placing themselves at risk. They would be placing them, the, you know, the insurers would be unlikely to be happy about that. So what I'm trying to illustrate is that, that there are others in the background that are interested in making sure that uh, something is implemented, and of course unions and so on who would take uh, employers to task if it's not uh, implemented. But I, I don't see a way that... Uh, I, I don't think we have the resources, actually, as sheriffs, to in any way deal with uh, case management, management beyond uh, d issuing a determination. But if you did have the resources, would you think it was appropriate that you should um, follow it through? Surely you would um, want to see your recommendations being implemented. Would you go so far as to see some of them being binding? legally binding? I think it's for others to do that. I don't think that the particular sheriff would be in any way um, really able to, to continue that sort of case management. Now, of course, as it's been said before, um, th th yourselves can deal with that. It's for the government to legislate in relation to something if something requires legislation. I, I don't feel that I should be a lawmaker. And of course, you have to look at the difference between an inquiry on the one hand and the other, everything else I do practically in court, which is adversarial. Mm -hmm. The inquiry isn't about saying, I am making a ruling and you must follow it. The inquiry is about saying, I have conducted an inquiry into this, which may include asking other people to come and give evidence until I'm satisfied that I understand what went wrong, if something went wrong. And then the pronouncement is, this is what went wrong. And perhaps this is what I think, on the basis of the evidence been presented to me, would have prevented this or might prevent it in the future. It's not a ruling against anyone. It's, it's the result of conducting an inquiry, an open inquiry into the facts. I think the concern is if it becomes a ruling against someone, we're looking at a very different animal, if you like. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. We understand the complexities. We're just thinking, trying to find out if of there's course. a way around it. Patricia, do you, you, do you mind if I'm bringing Patricia yeah, there with an right. example? Patricia, you, were you in for Patricia's example? Yes, yes, well, indeed. I think she makes a fair point there, yeah. which do you want to pick up on it? Um, yeah, I, I mean, I suppose what I, I would propose is that, um, and what I am proposing is that, um, where the sheriff feels that it's appropriate that they can make a recommendation that would be binding and that they have a mechanism to call that back at, at, and agree or at a point laid down in time uh, to look to see whether or not it's been, um, whether that's happened or not and that the person against whom that finding is made also has a right of appeal. Um, and that's an attempt to make it manageable, to, to make it 
uh, not something that will drag on forever. But I, but I think the, the, the point I was trying to make earlier um, that the convener has raised is that um, you know, if we truly learn the lessons and it is clear that that accident could have been prevented, that incident could have been prevented by a certain course of action, and it's quite clear that that's the case. And there have been some, as I gave the example earlier, where that is the, the situation, then surely we must find a way to be able to do that, to prevent further loss of life. I accept, as I said earlier, that in legal terms, the organisation or the institution leaves itself open to all sorts of challenge uh, and, and problems with insurance, etc. But surely, as a moral imperative rather than a legal one, we must be trying to prevent future deaths happening if we know that we can do that. And the example I gave is an example of when it would have been very clear that that was the case. I, I suspect the difficulty may be in getting, getting to that certainty. And that's where the, it, the whole process is, may become cumbersome, um, as, as was indicated earlier. That we're to, the, It is a concern, of, I know, of family members that an inquiry is held, dealt with, concluded. What you're anticipating seems to me to potentially involve changing tack, if you like, at a certain stage in the inquiry and going from the inquisitorial system into a more adversarial system in which one would have to perhaps think of pleadings, perhaps think of bringing in, in a, a more um, involved form of process so that the person against whom, and it could be many bodies, it, it could be fairly diverse, the implications of this, involving them potentially in giving answers, in the same way that if you were to take responsibility for it and, and, and go down the legislative route, you would have something like this. You would have, you would investigate all the potential difficulties. Now, a sheriff may not have that opportunity. So whilst in hindsight, yes, we can look at decisions and, and, and take the view, if only that had been promulgated, lives could be saved. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure how Without that kind of inquiry, how often that certainty can exist. So it's how we yeah. get to that that crossing that boundary mm -hmm. might be a difficult one. With all due respect, as the, the convener mentioned earlier, the idea that Parliament then legislates mm -hmm. means that you're, you're putting another delay into the system, a, which is already perhaps yes. uh, looking at an incident that happened four, five, six years ago, Absolutely. Um, when we don't know whether there could have been preventable deaths in that period, necessarily. I, I take your point. Um, so uh, my suggestion would be that sheriffs would have discretion where they thought it was appropriate to be able to make those kinds of recommendations and that those against whom those recommendations are made would have a time frame in which to act or to be brought back or that they have the right of appeal against that if they feel that the judgment has not understood the complexities on the matters before them. But it's an attempt to try and get action moving and to get something in place to make sure that we are preventing as many deaths as we possibly can. I accept it's not perfect, but I, I think we have to be having that debate. We, of course, can see the, the issue and have personal sympathies with the issue. The, the, the problem is you change the nature of the beast entirely by doing that, yeah. because anyone coming along, any parties involved in that inquiry, will have in the back of the minds that there might be a finding as opposed to a recommendation coming out of that, and it will turn it into an adversarial process. And especially having an appeal on the back of that, uh, extending the process. Now, I, I fully understand that legislation takes time, but... We can't be legislators. And you also may be, frankly, expanding every single fetal accident inquiry. That would be another concern of mine, that rather than having parties directly concerned with a specific death, that you might have bodies coming in concerned that on the back of this there may be such binding determinations and it may become just more cumbersome, more yeah. difficult for the family, for everyone, from day one. That's a concern. So we see it's not easy. System. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I've got Elaine, then I've got Christian on, the, on this point. Just, yeah, on, on, on that specific point, I, I just wondered, we've look, dis also discussed the way in which recommendations are reported. I wonder if what you're saying is actually an argument for the Scottish Government being more involved in the 
publication of the recommendations so that they are on top of the issues rather than relegating that to the court service. But I personally the Scottish would government welcome. should be doing that so that they can mm. learn the lessons from the recommendations made. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure it goes beyond what we properly should yes, be yes, uh, discussing uh, uh, from the point of view of not entering into the area of policy, mm. and that would be an area of policy. But uh, on a personal note, I would welcome that uh, level of involvement uh, uh, where something can be done. To stray away from policy, but to, to understand the mechanism, do you do any recommendations sometime after an inquiry to the Scottish Parliament, to the Scottish Government, to the UK Government? or your recommendation are never to a legal body like the, the government or the oil parliament? Yeah, agencies associated with it. I, I, I'm not sure I fully understand the question, but uh, we... Um, um, would, uh, sorry, uh, just to rephrase it, would it be possible maybe that you do a recommendation to the government and to the parliament, it will be a kind of passing, you know, pass, passing the oil inquiry to another level uh, if you feel yeah. it, it, needs to, it needs to be done? No, no, we don't, because that would politicise uh, what we are yeah. doing. So that I, we, we both have been involved in FAI, so we, we, we've got experience with it. What the exercise is to, if, if you can, identify what has gone wrong and why it has gone wrong, and the recommendation is on the back of finding all that out, mm -hmm. looking at the practical solution having been informed by the expert evidence that that would lead to that not happening again it is for others to pick up on that and take out of that what needs to be done to prevent it happening again and it, it really depends on what comes out of you you, know, you couldn't legislate for the variety of things we'd make recommendations to health and safety surely yes. do you yes. 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 yes almost you know mandatory oh yeah to professional yes, bodies of all sorts the recommendations yes, of made if, yeah, if, just to clarify you yes, don't just course. make a recommendation at large <laughs> you, you point the recommendation yes. to employers and health and safety and um, health boards or whatever but not to the government, I don't think. No, no, no. no. I'm I'm not I wouldn't want to be doing that. We make recommendations to the government. They sometimes pay attention, sometimes they don't. <laughs> Margaret. Uh, good morning. Uh, I wonder if I could ask you about delays in, in holding uh, fatality in inquiries generally and to comment on whether preliminary hearings um, will help with delays, um, making sure that the court is ready to, to go. And also to comment on something that isn't in the bill, and this is the idea of the early, um, the early hearing to try and ensure that within three months there's at least some indication of if we're going to go ahead or if not, what the problem is. I, a preliminary hearing is, I think, an important matter. And again, from personal experience, it, the, the, the sooner one can get... A, 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 a grasp of what the inquiry is about, then from the point of view of the sheriff, the sooner you can take a view on whether or not it's something which is formal and therefore can be dealt with quickly and everyone gets to find out what's happening, or you can look at it and say, well, I, I need this to be brought forward. This is something that hasn't been envisaged, but it will need to be uh, looked into. And so you may have a, can, a further preliminary hearing. As far as time is concerned, oh, I am... I'm conscious of the fact that a lot depends on the nature of the, the death and the nature of the uh, inquiries that the Lord Advocate may make into uh, that and how quickly they do it. We don't really have any control over that. I would, I would like to see it as quick as possible into the court, and preliminary hearings are a great idea. I'm not sure what the, the other option is. So it's, am I picking up correctly that you're considering bringing bring it before a court, before the court is seized with the matter. Yes, I've probably conflated the things which I shouldn't do because they are quite distinct processes. The early hearing being just to see where we are. In other words, concentrate the minds of the Crown and Procurator Fiscal Service that if they haven't made progress, the relatives will be informed why. And the Sheriff would be asking, you know, what is the, the position here? It's... it's process, I think, really, procedure, not looking at any facts in the case. But this it's would be once, on top of once the application, the notice is before the court. Yes. 
or before it. So that's what I'm not clear N not, about. Not even then, no. I, 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 I think it's the, the, Crown and Prec of, uh, the Crown and Procurator Fiscal Service are looking into the, the, um, the facts, the, I, the, the investigation, yeah. deciding you know, whether they are going to hold a, a, a fatal accident inquiry and when. The difficulty is that currently that is not a matter before the court. So effectively, if that were to happen, if I'm right in this, then um, a judge is effectively being, I don't know, a minute taker. You know, we have no power to do anything in that situation until the application is before the court. We are, what can we do with it? So it's a... I, I think the I, point I, was it would be held within three months. Um, it wasn't going ahead, but that would very much concentrate the Crown Procurator Fiscal Service to come and explain where they, they were uh, and what was the cause of the delay, either because it was so complex. And then I think the suggestion from um, Sheriff Nicholson was that if if you didn't have a, a, a clear idea of when it was going to take place, maybe convene again another, it could be very informal, just in the Sheriff's Chambers, uh, convene again to say, well, we'll meet again maybe in six weeks or another two months and, and just see where we are. So it didn't disappear. It was very much um, holding the Crown and Procurator Fiscal to, um, to account. And do we invite parties to this? It's public. It's public. That's the whole... Mm -hmm. That's the whole aspect of a fatal accident inquiry well, that's so important. I, I see your point about there need to be some kind of court, new court process in place for it. But it wasn't in public. It was really, I think, for um, the family and um, mostly the family to be kept apprised of the process in chambers so it isn't private. Uh, and I appreciate what you're saying is where would, this be, where would this be in the court process? Mm -hmm. There's been no referral. But presumably what Lord Cullen had mind is you add another mm -hmm. little thing. There will be an early hearing. It will be dealt with in this fashion. You know, some amendment to this bill. Really but to keep like a belt and braces um, for the families to know and relatives that, you know, what's the process? How is it going on? You know, a bit nothing of sub, not substantial facts in front of it, just process. We are doing this, you know, at what point um, the, there will be a delay, there will be a delay because of me, you know, just to let people know, rather than it just being somebody phoning up or whatever happens from the Lord Advocates or PF's office to tell people. Just changing it that way. But I do appreciate it. You need to know what, why what, you were there. What our what powers rule. are. What our powers are. I mean, currently yes, we're, we're speaking indeed. in a vacuum. No. Tell us what our powers are yes. and we can comment. Yes. But really, yes. we can't. And I wonder if... We'll ask Lord Cullen for an amendment. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but, perhaps, but, but perhaps um, making Crown Office uh, responsible to the family is a, an easier way of doing that. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. we hear you, I hear your difficulties mm -hmm. in that. Um, just on the same point, Lord Cullen <laughs> also recommended to keep the Crown and Procurator Fiscal Service um, on its toes. The fact that there should be proper resourcing of the Crown and Procurator Fiscal Service, maybe even a unit um, within the Crown and Procurator Fiscal, which I, I think he subsequently decided was there mm -hmm. under the death unit, in order to make sure that this was um, you know, a bit of a priority and, and it wasn't allowed to, to slip. We can't comment on that. Either. I see. Okay. It, 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 and that's because it's, it's a policy matter in relation to uh, resourcing. I, I, we, we certainly would like to see fatal access inquiries brought to court and dealt with as quickly as yes, possible. Absolutely. Of course. Can I ask if you think that you should retain the power to award expenses in certain circumstances, have discretion? My well, answer to that is yes, I think we should. It's rarely used. Uh, yes. that, that's been said earlier today. Okay. But to lose it, I think, would be unfortunate. Thank you very much. That concludes the evening session. Thank you very much. I'm going to suspend for five minutes.
Thank you very much. Um, right, I welcome our third and final panel of witnesses to the meeting. Right Honourable Lord Gill, Lord President, uh, Roddy Flynn, Legal Secretary of the Lord President, and Eric McQueen, Chief Executive of the Scottish Courts and Tribunals Service. And I thank you all for your written submissions. I know you were in for a substantial part of the previous evidence. So thank you. And I'll go straight to questions from members and looking around for volunteers. <laughs> Conscripts. I'll take anything that's going. <laughs> Alison. Okay. One of the concerns about the system at the moment is the number of delays, or the length of delays that there are. Do you believe that the, SC, the CTS bears any responsibility for delays in, in the FEI process at the moment? I, I don't think so. The, there are two forms of delay, and I think we've got to distinguish one from the other. There can be a delay between the occurrence of a death and the application by the Crown for a fatal accident inquiry. That's one kind of delay. Then there's the procedural question of delay. Once the inquiry has been applied for, is there a delay between then and having the inquiry conducted and concluded? Now, let's take the first one first. There are many reasons why there should be a delay between a death and the FAI. Uh, for example, it may take a very long time to ascertain the cause of death if you've got, for example, the Air Accident Investigation Board. You take something like the Clutha disaster, for example. It, take, it has taken quite a long time to find out exactly what happened there. So that I wouldn't describe that as delay. On the other hand, if there is an unreasonable length of time between the application for an inquiry and the the actual holding of the inquiry, then then there is a legitimate cause for concern there. My impression is that in current practice, once the Crown apply for an FAI, um, the, the matter is dealt with expeditiously. And I'm not aware of any uh, particular deficiency in our procedures in that regard. Mm. Mr. Uh, McQueen, of course, has probably got more practical detail than that. Well, they weren't volunteering, but now they <laughs> yeah. volunteered. Already we haven't really volunteered. Oh, I stopped him. <laughs> no, I mean, I, mean I, can, I can certainly give some more information if that would be, if Please. that would be helpful to the committee. Um, as the Lord President says, I mean, we, we don't see a picture of delays within the court system as being one that's particularly prevalent at the moment, but nevertheless, we do realise, like any part of the justice system, um, then there is a duty on us to try to make sure that there's continuous improvement in the process. Um, one case, once cases come to court, I mean, I think the important point to realise is that there is a period before it's appropriate for an FAI to go ahead, because quite clearly parties need time to prepare for that particular hearing, and somewhere around about 68 weeks seems to be the, the minimum period in terms of getting ready and prepared for the start of an FAI. We have around 50 FAIs a year on average, and it can vary, obviously, depending on particular ag accidents on an annual basis, but 50 seems to be the average number that's set. About 45% of those are one-day hearings, and they are all largely held within three to four months of the fatal accident application coming forward. A further 45% are hearings that last between two and, um, two and ten days, um, and most of those hearings again take place within three to four months, with some possibly taking se seven months if they're particularly longer or more um, evidence inquired. Only 10% of cases are the long duration ones, which are about 11 days of more. And again, most of those will be held within a four to five month period, with some of the longer ones possibly taking nine to 10 months. Um, we're certainly not aware of this being a problem for parties involved within FAIs. We're certainly not aware of it being raised as a particular issue within any of the evidence sessions. Um, as reported in the media last night, I think quite a good example was the, the tragic accident in Glasgow prior to Christmas, um, where the fatal accident inquiry was set up and due to start in July, but because of issues with the partners in terms of taking evidence, there is now some doubt in terms of whether that will proceed in its, its scheduled day. And I think that's quite the, the norm for a lot of the complicated FAIs, that there's no point just rushing things to a date, um, but it's about making sure that parties are ready and prepared to go and that evidence has been secured to make sure we can have an FAI starting and completing within the planned timescales. Thank you. Lord Gill, in your written submission, you've... Um suggested some specific case management powers that, that would help move things along a bit in relation to written evidence being tabled and things. Do you want to talk a little bit more in detail about that? Well, I would really urge two points upon the committee, if I may. One is that at the very forefront of our consideration is 
section 1, subsection 3 and subsection 4, um, it, it's quite easy, I think, sometimes to lose sight of what, what, what an FAI is all about. And it's made very clear in subsection 3 that the purpose of an inquiry is twofold. One, establish the circumstances of the death, and that's a straight factual question. And two, to consider what steps, if any, might be taken to prevent other deaths in similar circumstances. And there may well be cases where that second question doesn't even arise. But if you look at it in the context of that section and then look at the next section, which says it's not the purpose of an inquiry to establish civil or criminal liability, I think you begin to see that, in actual fact, an FAI is not a free-ranging operation where uh, all forms of evidence are admissible and relevant. It's a fairly tightly circumscribed remit. That's the first point. But the second point I would make is that in any inquiry of this nature, effective case management is the key to the whole thing. It has to be effectively case managed in the preparatory stages. And then once the inquiry starts, it requires efficient, competent chairmanship to ensure that these are the points that it addresses and the other questions are not gone into. It makes some considerable demands on the presiding sheriff, but yeah. as long as um, as long sheriffs keep this in mind, um, they should be able to conduct these inquiries expeditiously. Yes, um, just on the matter of, of delays, um, I note what you say, there's only 10% of the 50 uh, would go beyond the... 11 days and may go on to four to five months. Lord Cullen recommended the early hearing to be held within three months um, and that would be covering perhaps these um, these cases where it was being delayed. The main point being, I think, to, to keep the relatives informed and to make sure they are informed. Do you have a view on that? Yeah, I mean, I mean uh, sorry, I think there's two different things. One, one, just what I was talking about was the court end of the process, mm -hmm. yeah, in terms of these long hearing cases. Um, I think that there, there, there are some, I think, two particular perspectives in relation to the, 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 the early hearings, that, and I know the Lord President will want to make his own views on. First of all, for me, it's about trying to establish, well, well actually, what's the purpose of them? Um, because quite clear, there seems to be a suggestion that this is very much about keeping the crown on its toes, um, and it's very much about making sure that there's good information in relation to the flow of information between the crown and the family. That to me sounds like very much an, an, a management oversight of COPF, COPFS, and I'm just slightly puzzled as to why that is best seen to be some sort of a judicial role. And to me, there's there's quite a fundamental question in terms of is that a proper role and a proper use of judicial time, which is essentially about the management of Crown Office in terms of how they operate and how they communicate with um, with with um, with families involved. And I think Lord Cowan himself said that if there was improvements the way that was happening, then actually that would negate possibility or at least lessen the argument for these early hearings. So I say, first of all, I, I do have an issue about whether the purpose of it is correct. I think, secondly, there's also a need to be given thought about the numbers that may be involved. Um, there's currently about 5,500 cases per year that the Crown Office investigate, and I'm presuming that you're not suggesting there's an early hearing for 5,500 cases. Um, if that was the case, even on a, a simple arithmetic, if you thought each hearing was going to take 30 minutes, um, that would take about the equivalent of two and a half sheriffs every year just simply to have these early hearings. So presumably if these early hearings were being thought of, it would be only in terms of cases that were mandatory for having an FAI, which would at least reduce it to a lower number of potentially hundreds rather than many, many thousands. So, th so I think there is this issue about, first of all, the principle, is it correct and a proper judicial role? I say, which certainly I would have my doubts against. Um, but secondly, just the volumes in terms of how it could clog up a court system depending on whether it was all reported instances or just those that were deemed to be mandatory. But I say the Lord President might well have views about the propriety of a judicial role. We're talking here, Ms Mitchell, about an, an earlier hearing than a preliminary hearing conducted under Section 15, is that right? 
nature. Yes, it's yes. It's really just trying to explain to the, the relatives yes. what's happening, not to establish facts or, or no. to say if you are, are ready to go to court. None of these things to keep the relatives informed and to make sure the Crown Procurator Face School do that, which yeah. we've heard in evidence they don't always just now. No. So if not them, whom? I, I, I have to say I'm not really enthusiastic about this idea. Can um, tell. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's not, it's not that, that, I, that I, I'm not conscious of the need for uh, an expeditious conduct to the thing, but I'm just not sure that it, 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 it's the best way to go about it. Firstly, the, the, the court has to be very careful not to trespass upon Crown prerogative. And of course, the the whole question of initiating an FAI lies with the Lord Advocate. So I wouldn't like the court to be put in the position where it was exercising some sort of supervisory role over the Crown's uh, decision-making process. I think there would be a very serious constitutional issue there. But in addition to that, um, I think it could it, 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 it could be very expensive, you know, if, the, if they had these meetings on a regular basis. Uh, there would be a considerable public cost, particularly if, if, if lawyers were involved. And there would also be, I think, um, a, a, a sort of a tendency to ha have meetings for the sake of having meetings rather than achieving anything. I think that the real answer here is if the Crown were to establish good protocols of, of conduct by which they kept the relatives in touch and so that they knew what was going on, we could achieve the same thing without the need for for meetings. That would be my view anyway. Uh, and if these protocols weren't adhered to, who monitors that or, or who then picks that up? I yeah. think that's the problem. Yes, well, you see, that, that I think is the point where I find it difficult because I would not like to see the court attempting to exercise some sort of supervisory authority over the Lord Advocate mm -hmm. because I think that would be constitutionally wrong. And is that because it's the court? Could anyone look at these protocols to see if the Crown and Procurator Fiscal was adhering to uh, a reasonable time scale? Well, my experience has been that, uh, in, particularly in controversial cases, the, the, the relatives tend to be fairly vocal if there is delay or if, if there is a failure to give answers to what they would see as straight questions. So that I, think, I think there is a degree of scrutiny of, of, of the process in most cases. But the answer, I think, I'm, is for the Crown to um, make plain uh, its recognition of the need for expedition and to, to, to produce a regime of, of in, in, informing everybody with an interest in just exactly where they are. The, the tenor of what we've heard so far is there isn't really a problem with delays, there might be an odd one or two, and uh, uh, perhaps that's not what you intend to come over. But I, I rather feel there's a little bit of a glossing over of the the real hardship that the families mm. face when they're not getting the information, yeah. and it does happen. They don't get the information, and they don't have the wherewithal to do anything yeah. about that. No, I entirely sympathise with that point of view. I think if you are the the families of someone who's you know, of people who've been injured or uh, killed in, in in accidents obviously um it's very difficult to accept that time passes and nothing seems to be happening but as as we all know there are many cases where there are very good reasons for that and as long as the crown are able to uh, articulate what those reasons are then i think public confidence is maintained that's key. Ask the Solicitor yeah. General next week. It's really the balls in the yeah. Solicitor General and Lord Advocates Court. Can, can also just confirm one point, and it's just on this issue about delays, and I'm sorry if I gave you the impression of glossing over. When I was talking about delays on the court end, I'm talking about from where the court is informed that an FAI is proceeding till the time the hearing takes place. Yeah, I fully accept there's a much longer period in that intervening period, which is, I think, the point of your early hearings. So I wasn't trying to suggest that that's no, not I an think, issue I think period. we accept there are many reasons yeah. why there might be a long, a long delay before there's even a decision if it's mm. not a mandatory FAI, yeah. or even if it was a mandatory, yeah. why it's not actually taking place. I think we concur in the complexity mm. in some of the cases, but we just thought we'd test the early hearing idea, and mm. as usual, we've had contradictory evidence, but that's all jolly, <laughs> and that's all grist to the mill. John? Okay, Commissioner, uh, 
Panel, I'm interested, um, we keep hearing the term family, and clearly families are absolutely at the heart of any uh, issue here. But there's also work colleagues, and there's also the public, and uh, uh, as elected representatives, we, we sometimes have to fend off press inquiries about, about deaths um, for very many months whilst decisions waited, whether there's going to be an FEI and whether indeed there's going to be criminal prosecutions. How do you suggest, you may say that's further down the line than um, before it reaches you, but how do we address that? Because certainly, you know, it's all very well keeping families involved. How are the public kept involved and informed? I'm not sure that uh, there's a satisfactory answer I could give you to that because so often the Crown's processes are reserved to the Crown and there could be very well be cases where the Crown would consider it not to be in the public interest to be making announcements and statements about a case. And I can think of several very good reasons for that. There may, have been, there may be doubt as to the cause of death. There may be the need to carry out uh, confidential inquiries um, and obtain expert views. Uh, and sometimes these things do take a long time. If it's just a question of the Crown saying that, then I can't see any problem over that. But it may be there's a perception that because the Crown are not saying anything, that in some way or another there's a culture of secrecy. I think that would probably be a, 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 wrong, a wrong perception. Well, I, I think it is a challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think everything should be done in the public interest. I think the family is part of the public yeah. interest, but if things are done in the public interest, I think yeah. that's the most important. But, but I, I mean, I take it, you, you do accept that there are cases where it takes a very long time to find out the cause of death. Yes, indeed, yeah, and, yeah, and I would yeah. dearly love to share the example with you, but for obvious reasons I can't, no. and it is one where there are various layers of interest. Clearly, there's a family interest, there's a community interest, mm. there's an ongoing police interest as well, and yeah. um, well, it, it does become very complicated. Many years ago, I was one of the senior counsel in the Lockerbie uh, inquiry, and, and it took several years before that the, the Crown were in a position to, to hold the inquiry for very good reasons. Well, not I'll avoid any questions. <laughs> <laughs> you and I will back off from that. Yeah, uh, that's for another day. Um, Christian, followed by Elaine, followed by Jane, followed by Rod. Thank you very much, Governor, and good afternoon. Uh, you just spoke, Lord President, about the Lockerbie disaster, and that comes into my question regarding the... Um, <laughs> I don't know why I bother to breathe, the, even, the, but just go ahead. No, I... <laughs> the, the example you took uh, 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 coming to light regarding the death abroad, and and we had some uh, some uh, some people asking if death abroad uh, should have uh, always have the body uh, coming back to Scotland. Is there exceptional cases? Are you sympathetic to the idea that there are exceptional cases that maybe death could be inv in investigated without having the body back to Scotland? I've got no strong views on the matter. I, I doubt very much if there would be many cases where that was a, a problem. But uh, if if the Parliament wants to enact that provision, I, I've got no strong views about it. It could be very useful in some cases. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for the answer. Before you move on, is yours, Gil, is yours no, a supplement no, it's different? So it's a completely, yeah, completely separate question. question. Sorry. Separate. Sorry. On the list, right? Thank you very much, Governor. Uh, going back to the end of the process, uh, are you sympathetic as well to the call that um, the, uh, the recommendation of the sheriff should be binding? No. <laughs> I, 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 don't, uh, I don't think that's a good idea at all. The sheriff makes a recommendation within the context of an FAI in which, as I've tried to emphasise, the remit is very tightly constrained. But there may well be other um, evidence that is not before the inquiry, which may emerge later, or it may simply be um, only of indirect relevance to section one, subsection three. So in that case, the sheriff's recommendation might very well 
require to be reconsidered in the light of other evidence. And to make it mandatory introduces a, a completely unnecessary degree of rigidity. And it could, in fact, lead to completely unhelpful recommendations having to be acted upon. I don't think that's in the public interest at all. We heard this morning that it could maybe uh, change all the process altogether, it's a process of an inquiry, uh, mm. if, if we had that into the bill. Would you agree with that point? Y y yes. Let, let's suppose the Sheriff made a, a, a mandatory recommendation about something that affected an entire industry. <laughs> That's the sort of thing where committees sit for years devising safety codes and you, you might have the Sheriff and Forfer deciding some rec on some recommendation that would acquire some legal force. Uh, that, that can't be right. If I may, another question as well. You just talk about the sheriff in Forfa, the location <laughs> or where the sheriff, the, where, where the inquiry should take place. Yeah. Uh, do you think that the, the bill... Oh, links to your questions, <laughs> like some BBC interviewer, <laughs> off you go. <laughs> do you think the bill strikes the right balance to try to encourage mm -hmm. having special uh, cases taken somewhere else yeah. and at the same time trying to keep the, uh, the idea that it should be local if needed? And should it be in the bill that it should be local? Uh, should be a head local if needed. Yeah. No, I think uh, in most cases, I think it would be pretty obvious that the inquiry should take place in the jurisdiction where the accident happened. But there will be cases where it is much more appropriate that it should take place where the families are. And uh, I think that gives us the necessary degree of flexibility. I, I'm all in favour of that. You, you're quite happy the way the bill is drafted. You yes. think it strikes a balance yes. where, where you wanted it to. I have no criticism to make of the bill in that regard. So we don't need a presumption put in as the sheriff No, I don't think suggested. so. No, the idea is to keep things as flexible as possible because you just never know when the unexpected is going to happen. Thank you. Um, Elaine. Thanks. If I can go back to the issue of the sheriff's recommendations, the bill suggested that the SETS be delegated to collate and publish the responses, whereas Lord Scullin's uh, original recommendations were that the Scottish Government should do that, thereby, I suppose, charging the government with the responsibility of de overseeing it and determining whether actually legislation ought to uh, proceed from uh, some of those recommendations, if, for example, they are things which could affect an entire industry. Are you happy with the role that's given to SETS? Does that have implications in terms of the resourcing of SCTS? Uh, or should actually Lord Cullen's initial recommendations that the uh, government be responsible for that? Would uh, that be I preferable? submitted a, a memorandum on the bill um, and I, I, I was unenthusiastic about the idea, to say the least. Mm -hmm. um, it seemed to me that it wasn't really, uh, that the SCTS was not really an appropriate body for that particular responsibility. But on the other hand, I have to say, I can't think of any other body that would be any more appropriate for that responsibility. And I've come to the view, and it, I think it's shared by Mr. McQueen, that um, uh, as long as we are properly resourced to do the job, I think we, we undoubtedly have the, uh, the, the skills available to, to be able to do this. So I'm not opposing it anymore. It's not really, uh, you know, I wasn't really sort of questioning the skills of SCTS to be able to do it. It's just in terms of where there are recommendations which could require some sort of legislative change, yeah. would it not be better for government to take that responsibility because they would have the responsibility of introducing the legislation? Well, the, the government is always uh, completely informed of the mm. decisions and views of SCTS. Um, and I, I, I really don't see this as a big mm. problem. Mm. Um, Mr. McQueen will see it, of course, from a management perspective. Yeah, I mean, both, both the, obviously, the, um, the, the sheriff's determination and the recommendations um, it would be published and, and would be shared with the Scottish Government. Um, as the World President says, I think we're being more pragmatic rather than particularly happy about it. Um, but nevertheless, we, we see there is a, a logical link that actually there'd be a, 
an SCTS website which would have the determination, it would have the recommendations, and it would have the responses to those recommendations. So in terms of openness and transparency, um, it would be there for everyone to see. Um, it's not particularly a, a skill that we have in terms of making assesses on responses coming back, and we need to put in a function in place to, to deal with that. We've made it clear to Scottish Government what that would take in resource terms, and that they are prepared to support us in providing those resources if need be. Uh, is the financial mem memorandum adequate then for? Um, I think what we have agreed, something with Scottish Government, it would be something in the region of about £60,000 a year to provide the function that would deal with the response to all the recommendations, any redaction, any legal advice that we require on them, um, and then subsequent publications. Thank you. Jane. It's following on from that, I'll get another link. Um, what would the practical implications be for SCTS if there were more mandatory FAAIs required? Would that, would that be a resource implication? Or, or? Yeah, I think it depends, um, as always in these things, as, as essentially how long is a piece of string. Um, so I think it would depend on how many mandatories and, and what specific cases were. Of the ones that are particularly suggested within the bill, we don't see that as being a major impact. Um, some of these may already be taken forward as, as discretionary FAIs, and the Crown Office's view on making an assessment is they expect the number of additional FAIs would probably be less than five in any one year. Now, given our average is about 50 in any year, that can range between 30 and 60, as long as it's within those sort of tolerances, it's not a major issue. If there was changes at any later stage, it was increasing the mandatory cases to a much wider range and possibly longer running FAIs, then quite clearly it would be a bigger resource issue. Um, but certainly in terms of the provisions within the current bill, it's not something that gives us any major concerns. And, and just to follow on from that, um, we've, had, we've heard evidence previously on the 5th of May and, we, and again this morning about... Um, People who are subject to mental health detention, if they commit suicide whilst in that detention, should that trigger a, a mandatory FAI? I wonder if Lord Gill's got a view on that. I, I'm, I'm not convinced of that, I have to say. Um, you know, there are many uh, fatal accidents where the cause of death and the precautions that could have avoided it are completely open and shut. And very often in suicide cases, I think there's absolutely no need for an inquiry. Very often the circumstances are completely conclusive as to what the cause was. The other thing I think is that uh, it'd be very difficult to legislate in such a way as to make only those particular deaths uh, mandatory. Uh, and I, 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 To be honest, I can't quite see the justification for it. It seems to me that one of the justifications might be that people who are in the care of the state, the, the risk should be minimised, and if there's, if there's circumstances relating to their accommodation or, or their care that might have contributed towards that suicide, then that needs to be identified and acted upon. Yes, I, I, I see that point, but I think that we can rely upon the, the good judgement of the Crown to, to know exactly the type of case that where that issue arises and the other cases where it plainly doesn't. Thanks. Thank you, convener. Child not. I mean, the, the section four is a child required kept detained in secure accommodation. Should that be broader for a child who's in the care of the state rather than just in secure accommodation? Yeah. Well, I, I, here again, I think we're in danger of imposing unnecessary rigidity into this system. Um, the system by which the Crown makes investigations and forms a judgment is, I think, the, the best model. And Why would you pick there for secure accommodation and say that's special, but a child who's not actually in secure accommodation, but is, of course, in the care of the state, but not in secure accommodation, shouldn't have a mandatory, there shouldn't be a mandatory um, FAI. Well, I'm, I, I'm, not, um, I'm not taking up any sort of rigid position on this. If, mm -hmm. if that's what the Parliament wants, I, I, I'm certainly actually, not opposed I'm seeking, to it. I'm just seeking your view as yeah. to what the distinction should be. Well, I, I just think that... Uh, at the moment, um, the Crown exercises uh, its prerogative in, in a responsible way, and um, I think we can uh, rely upon that. But uh, 
if if the parliament decides that, that it wants something stronger than that, then I, I, I'm not here to argue against it. Yeah, I see. It, it may be that the committee takes the view that a child's in a special circumstance um, a and the state is in a different role yeah. um, from any other parent or foster or carer or something and, and, and has duties. Yeah. Madam Convener, that's a perfectly tenable point of view. I love to hear that. So it's not, I don't hear it very often, so I'll write that down, <laughs> commit it to memory. Uh, you might tell my leader that as well sometimes. Um, I now move on to Rod, followed by Gill. Um, thank you, Convener. Um, morning, or oh, afternoon, I should say, Lord Gill. Um, we've heard some concerns about the creation of specialist sheriffs in fatal accident inquiries, leading to a possible centralisation of the fatal, inquiry, fatal accident inquiry process. Any comments on that? I don't think that's, uh, I don't think that's going to happen. Um, I, I don't think that there is any immediate prospect of there being a centralised FAI system with a national FAI venue. Um, that's not in contemplation at the moment, and I don't think it's even on the far horizon. Um, and I don't see any need for it either. In, this, in, the, in the Courts Reform Act, if I... Forgive me for mentioning that. Uh, we've given, we've, we've, as it were, broken down the rigid barriers in sheriffdoms, and sheriffs now have the flexibility to sit wherever they're, they're sent. So if there were to emerge a small group of specialist FAI sheriffs, they could be deployed anywhere in Scotland as the need arose. And that, I think, is a much better solution than having a centralised venue. And in terms of uh, participation um, and the powers available to the sheriff uh, to decide who might participate in the inquiry, you've commented on that in your written submission. Would you just like to expand on that, why, why you think it's important to give the, the sheriff the flexibility to control participation? The, at the end of the day, the sheriff must conduct these FEIs efficiently. And what that means is making the most productive use of the time available, eliminating unnecessary or irrelevant evidence, and eliminating unnecessary or irrelevant questioning. And in order to do that, the sheriff must have a discretion to decide who will be the inquiry participants. And he must make a judgment on that on the basis of the circumstances of the case and the representations made to the sheriff by those who claim to have an interest. And that's just a perfectly normal facet of effective case management. Thank you. Thank you. You've got something to entry to yes, evidence. Well, the, the previous session, um, the Sheriff's Association were concerned about uh, summary sheriffs dealing with FAIs, I think the, the argument they were putting forward was that it may not become apparent early on that the case was complex and that summary sheriff might not have sufficient experience And uh, as the case developed. How do you respond to that? Do you agree with them on that? that the, the, the summary sheriff will be perfectly capable of conducting a straightforward fatal accident inquiry if, the, if it is a more complex inquiry, then the, the, a sheriff should do it. But in every case, what I think we must do here is trust to the judgment of the sheriff principal, who will, who will choose whoever he thinks is the appropriate person to conduct it, based upon their experience and expertise. Okay, finally, also, um, do you think that the bill should allow sheriffs to retain the power to uh, award expenses. That's a current power which they have, which doesn't seem to be replicated in the bill. Do you think it should be? I, 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 I'm, I'm not in favour of a power to award expenses. Um, firstly, the awarding of expenses is a typical procedure in adversarial litigation. But a fatal accident inquiry is not adversarial litigation. It's simply a concerted effort to find the truth. And the only reason why one would ever wish 
to av award expenses against a party at an FAI would be if the party had behaved unreasonably or vexatiously or wasted time. And the bill gives the sheriff the, the power to keep people like that out of the inquiry, either by not, not letting them be participants or by um, efficient management of the case as it's being heard. Um, and, and if the sheriff knows what, you know, sheriffs, they do know what they're doing. And, and if, if the sheriff is in control of the proceedings, that then there should be no need for that problem ever to arise. I did say it was very rarely used, but presumably yeah. it was only being used in those cases that you illustrate there. Yeah. I like it when lawyers disagree with each other or the <laughs> sheriffs disagree with the Lord President. That's, that's par for the course. Uh, Gil. Uh, good afternoon, panel. Um, it's back to the mandatory uh, FEIs, and I wondered, I, I think Lord Gill touched on this, but maybe just for fullness for the evidence, what the panel's uh, uh, view is in regards to mandatory FEIs for industrial diseases. Well, I, I'm not in favour of the idea of mandatory FEIs at all. I think there is a question here as to the Crown's prerogative to decide when and in what circumstances an FEI should be applied for. And if you make that mandatory, then I think you may be trespassing upon the judgment of the Crown. That's my first point. My second point is that in many cases the holding of an FEI is completely unnecessary because the facts are absolutely staring you in the face and there is simply no need for it. And, and that is where the Crown exercises its judgment. The third thing I would say is that this could be huge, hugely costly in terms of public cost and I'm not at all convinced that it is there is any cost benefit. Lastly, before you could make any judgment on this matter, you would really need to know what difference the introduction of mandatory FEIs would make in terms of numbers. And I don't know the answer to that, but I think it rests with those who would have mandatory FEIs to, to, to make some assessment of what the numbers of FEIs, what additional number of FEIs there would be. And at the moment, we just don't know. And, uh, Ms McQueen, uh, you want to make further comment? Are you happy with that? Um, not really. I mean, as I say, we don't have the information or data in terms of what these potential cases could be or, or the volume or the impact. Would the Lord Advocate's uh, discretion kick in, uh, you know, in the industry that, that I know so well, there's lots and lots of new processes and, and uh, uh, new, new substances being used. Would, would the Lord Advocate kick in in that, his discretion, kicking in, in, in that, play, in that Just, regard? That's exactly the sort of consideration that the Lord Advocate takes into account. So there's a couple of um, this case management thing, this keeping a grip on the FEI and keeping it to the straight and narrow, um, which you've raised. If I paraphrase it, you're in sec you ask in section 10, you're seeking uh, or you suggest amendments, uh, really, which would make the sheriff in your submission discretion to which the extent to which any person should participate by just look broadly at them and also agreement of facts before an inquiry yeah. you know where you're suggesting that the agreement of the evidence so i think that's kind of written um statements in advance to the sheriff yeah. how how do you see that working um you know would it would it preclude people perhaps wrongly from being part of it if you're you know if they're I mean, would these have to be statements have to be drafted by somebody with a legal background? An ordinary person might not know how to express stuff if they wanted to take part in the, a fatal accident inquiry, I mean, miss stuff out that might be relevant. Well, I, I uh, strongly favour the idea that in an inquiry procedure, 
as much of the evidence should be presented in written form as is, as is possible. That eliminates unproductive use of time in the inquiry. Mm -hmm. The evidence can then be taken as read, and then if, if anyone wishes to cross-examine on that evidence, then they can indicate on what topics they wish to cross-examine the witness. And what you find in practice is that a great deal of the evidence, probably two-thirds or more of it, is completely uncontroversial, and it's just, it's there and it's taken as read. And I fail to see what benefit there is in having it read out uh, other than to prolong the inquiry and incur public cost. That's the first point about the about evidence in, in, in writing. I would also consider that um, the, the prelim, preliminary hearing procedure is the, the key to obtaining agreement on facts uh, at an early stage. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that there's no need to lead evidence that is uh, uh, is completely uncontroversial. Another aspect of efficient uh, inquiry management is to limit the participation of certain parties to the inquiry uh, where there are topics in the inquiry on which they have nothing to contribute. And uh, I don't think that there's anything... Uh, unfair or unreasonable in that. That that would be my Yes, no, I thought I'd raise it as you've as you quite a substantial part of your written submission deals with really um tightening up as it were uh, the evidence to go before an FAI. You say it would allow uncontroversial evidence to be lodged in the form of a report or an affidavit. Yeah. Um if you're an ordinary person you need to you know, to swear an affidavit, would there be legal aid for people to do this? No, I don't would, think... Would it um, not require that? I, I don't think that that would ever be a, a requirement. I was merely suggesting ways in, in which yes. it, it could be done. If I could give you an example from the, the stock line inquiry, admittedly that wasn't an FAI, but it was dealing with a series of fatalities. Um, a great deal of the evidence was obtained by... Uh, the procurator fiscal interviewing witnesses and getting their recognitions and then the inquiry team at the stock line inquiry followed that up with their own um, um, interviews with certain of the, the, the key witnesses and this, the, the system worked quite well I thought and I, I'm not sure that uh, there's any need for the formalities of affidavits. It says that would, uh, in your submission, that would, for example, allow uncontroversial evidence to be lodged in the form of a report or an affidavit. Yeah. And then goes on to say, and it be considered and treated as evidence in chief. Yeah. So that's why I raise affidavit, yeah. because it's in your submission. Yeah. yeah, by all means, if you want to make an affidavit, if it's on something that's controversial, yes. But so much of it's uncontroversial that affidavit procedure would be unnecessary. John. Thank you. I don't know if you're present, Lord Gill, I asked two of the previous witnesses about this particular uh, submission you'd made, and, and I, I'm concerned anything that would appear to limit. I mean, I understand that you'll, mm. you don't want a free-ranging, all-over-the-place inquiry. You want it kept to the specific. Um, but uh, how would you establish if someone's got something of value to say without having heard from them either in writing or yeah. in person? That's where, they, that's where good... Uh, case management comes into the picture because under section 15 at the preliminary hearings the whole overriding purpose is to identify what the key factual issues are and if other people come along and say oh, well we've got we've got three more issues that we want to investigate it's then for the sheriff to decide if that falls within section one subsection three and if it doesn't he says so and that's that but so it's participation in the actual event rather than the entire process that you're talking about? Yes. I, the, I okay. It's possible, I think, to have quite a range of participants in an inquiry, but with, with some of them only, only contributing on certain issues. I understand. OK, thank you. Well, that... Oh. Clarification. I understood something you said a little bit earlier on when you were talking about mandatory inquiries. Were you saying you were 
not in, we are not in favour of any mandatory inquiries or just the extension of mandatory no, inquiries? No, what I'm not in favour of is an, a blanket requirement that right. every fatal accident must result in an inquiry. Okay. I, okay. I honestly don't see the point. We that. thought you were saying something devastating no. there. No. <laughs> as, a, as a final no. No. blow to the legal system. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> No. Well, can I, can I, I'm glad that got clarified, <laughs> Elaine. Well done. Uh, can I thank you all for your evidence? And as you know, this is Lord Girdle's last appearance. He'll be delighted to know more than before he retires. Can I thank you for a very instructive and sometimes, if I may say so, entertaining answers. I really must pick up on this phrase, not enthusiastic. It's such <laughs> yeah. a body blow to things. I think I'll deal with that. Thank anyway, you. we wish you well in your retirement. Thank you very Ma much. Madam Convener, can I just say that it's always been a pleasure to appear before this committee. And I'm grateful to you and your members and your predecessors for the great courtesy that I've always been shown. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I'll suspend now because we're going into private session as previously agreed.